So now, uh, Bryce and I are going to talk about something uh, that we've... I've watched all three episodes of Dark Side of the Ring. Uh, you watched the most recent episode, which yeah. is the Montreal Screwdrop yeah. episode, which is amazing that uh, after I listened to uh, Bruce Pritchard's podcast about it, like almost two years ago at this point, I even said like, you know, I thought I'd be done hearing about Montreal, but there's just something so intriguing about it that anytime anybody wants to talk about it, I want to hear about it. Yeah. So they did, you know, an episode about the Montreal Screwdrop narrated by Dutch Mantel, which I thought was really cool. Did you catch yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Fully narrated narrated the episode about Brody. What was his name recently? Uncle was uh, Zeb he, but he was but he Uncle was Zeb 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 Kaya. Kaya. Okay, yeah. okay. Thank you. Um when he managed uh, Jacob and Eli Blue. Yeah. Um so the first episode that I saw was the Bruiser Brody one. Um, which is you gotta watch that dude. Oh I will. Um I'm not sure I'm and it's narrated by Mick Foley. Oh, then, is it? Yeah, the, the second, the second and third, the Macho Man and Randy episode, and this one are narrated by uh, Dutch Mantel. Dutch Mantel, yeah. Um, all right. So you're like me; you never get enough of hearing about this. No, you, I mean, dude, I like I don't. Not to interrupt, and, yeah. I, I, and I think we, I'm sure we've talked about this before, but I mean, you were one of like you, you got your hands on wrestling with shadows like as soon as you could, right? Oh I yeah, I I couldn't wait to hunt yeah. that down. Uh, hearing people talk about that for, for so long before I was able to get my hands on it because just so many people had seen it, it had been screened right. in places, then it was finally released that I just felt like I had gold in my hands yeah. once I had it. And so it's like you said, man, like you kind of can never get enough. And right. like even now, like I feel like I can sit down and watch that even knowing what I know now and still just find it super fucking interesting. Yeah. Um, I was a huge, huge fan of Bret Hart as a kid. Yeah, huge fan. Same. And I really hate that this whole incident in Montreal. I hate calling it the screw job because it wasn't. Uh, this whole incident in Montreal really was his own doing. Um, you hear guys talk about it all the time. If you're a wrestling fan, if you're a hardcore wrestling fan, and you look into things like hell. Even if you're not, when you, if you just love wrestling and you used to watch back in the day and you go back to a world class, the Freebirds always did the job when they were leaving the territory. Then they'd go somewhere else. And then if they were in Memphis and they were going to go back to Dallas, they would do the job in Memphis on their yeah. way out to go back to Dallas. It's what you do when you leave the territory. It's the time on tradition. It really is, man. It, and it makes a lot of sense. And it's something that really bothers me about guys like Undertaker and not so much him lately, but like... Uh, Triple H, Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, mm -hmm. like all the guys that I loved growing up have not furthered anybody. Like yeah. Ric Flair lost to Shawn Michaels. Awesome, great match, but who did that help? Shawn Michaels lost to Undertaker. Undertaker. Awesome, great match, but who did that help? Undertaker loses to Brock Lesnar. Which was like this amazing shock and awe moment, but Lesnar's gone ten months out of the year. So who did that help? Yeah, nobody. And then finally, when he did do the job to Roman Roman Reigns, when it, it should have nothing. meant everything, it meant nothing. Yeah. So like it, it actually it actually bothers me that and it, it, it insert whoever there it doesn't have to be Roman Reigns. It bothers me that Undertaker lost again at WrestleMania because I think that almost cheapens Brock's. Win. Yeah, yeah. So, like, nobody from the era of wrestling that I grew up really, like, my formative years watching have, have done that. Mm -hmm. And it's really shitty because if Brett was leaving, he should have lost the belt to Shawn Michaels in a cool, awesome match. That Because even though they had all this fucking animosity, that match was still amazing and riveting to watch. Until the finish happens out of nowhere, and you're like, "What the hell?" Yeah. Um, so you can't. You have to do that. You you have to. Uh, it, it goes with anything. You have to leave the place better than when you found it. Yeah, for sure. And Brett was not interested in doing that. No, he wasn't. I, I, I'm giggling. I just want to explain before we go off too more too much. Uh, did you record it that night? Like, did you have it? Yes. My friend Ryan and I kept rewatching yeah. the part where it happened over and over and over again. That 
And then um, Ken Shamrock wrestles The Rock that night. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Ken Shamrock wins with the ankle lock and just that we would we kept going back and forth from the screw job to the finish of that <laughs> match because it's there's just something funny the camera pans in on the rock screaming in agony because of the ankle lock then it cuts back to Ken Shamrock who's wrenching it in just screaming back <laughs> and my friend Ryan and I were fucking hysterical over that like it, it's funny I know I would I want to turn that on later yeah like and just to it just to see out. that but yeah like I just kept watching that over and over and over again man like that it was. It was crazy. Like, I was so... I couldn't b- wait to read what was happening, yeah. you know, after that happened. Um, but yeah, you're yeah. right. You, you gotta leave the territory the Better right way. Better than you found it. Better than you found yeah. it. All that stuff. And so, and Brett wasn't interested in doing that. And so here's the my main gripe with Brett. That's my main gripe with Brett overall. And it kind of... Like, when he went to WCW, like, he... A lot of people... Oh, WCW didn't know how to book Brett Hart. W, but... People that were, you know, hardcore wrestling fans of that era, whether they want to admit it or not, know that Brett didn't leave the way he should have left. And, like, that cheapened his legacy. And that made him less relatable and less watchable in WCW. Not just their bad booking of him. It was all of that together. Yeah. And everybody wants to blame Eric Bischoff and bad booking of WCW. They tried to go out there and give Bret Hart, like, this awesome 20-minute match on Sold Out 98 with Ric Flair. It fell flat mm-hmm. because it wasn't a good match, and it felt like it was they were running in mud. And I also feel like it cheapened Brett's legacy the way he left, yeah. and it made me not want to be a fan of his anymore. Yeah, um, it's always. Could you imagine if that happened today? Like how many people would have jumped on the screw job bandwagon even more so than they did then, because the outrage culture in the world, like it would have been, uh, yeah, insane. So it happened at like just the right time, yeah, because like the internet. Was a thing then, obviously. Yeah. And there was wrestling news and all that stuff, but it wasn't where... Like, I feel like in 97, right? Yep. In 97, you could you could probably still accurately say a lot of that live crowd probably isn't reading the internet. Right. That's probably still accurate at the time. That used to be WWE's thing. Like, they would say that. It's like, oh, well, not everyone is right. reading this or that. But yeah, today, when everybody is reading that, yeah, that would have been... That couldn't happen. I mean, think of the way everybody's jumped on the whole independent contractor thing right now, whether they watch wrestling or not. Mm -hmm. They don't understand Mm -hmm. anything about it, but, oh, fucking, this douchebag on HBO said something about it, so let's all... I can't I, yeah, that's like any. I feel like that's any sort of fucking piece on wrestling that's not from... It's just it's so obnoxious. I hate it. So, right away, uh, when this thing starts, Brett's like, you know, my story is the only story that's never changed. And then he talks about how, you know... When Vince told him he was going to be losing to Sean, he went, they went to the locker room and he talked to Sean and he said, Hey, just so you know, anytime you're out there with me, you're going to be safe and I'm going to take care of you. You're never going to get hurt and it's going to be a good match. And I stuck my hand, stuck my hand at the shake and he shook my hand. He said, that's nice to know, but I won't do the same for you. He's already changed his story because in his book, he talks about that specific interaction with Sean and the story he tells in his book is, you know, Vince told me that I'm putting Sean over for the belt in Montreal, and I had no problem with it. So I went in there, and I shook his hand, and I said, listen, Sean, I understand that Vince thinks it's best for the company if I put you over in Montreal mm-hmm. and lose the title to you. And just so you know, I have no problem doing the job to you. And then Sean says, well, thanks, and that's good to know, but I wouldn't do the same for you. And that's Brett's sticking point throughout the entire fucking book, is that he said he wouldn't do the job for me. So That's his sticking me. point. Yeah. So he doesn't respect me. It had nothing to do with being safe or not getting hurt or having a good match, which is what he framed it on this documentary as, is why he was so upset. No, yeah. he was upset because, according to him, Sean said he wouldn't return the favor ever. That was the problem. So there his story has already changed. Yep. And then you talk, they talked to Earl Hebner, who's obviously like, man, this was such a weird thing, and... You know, but Brett and I are friendly now. And then it cuts back to Brett. Yeah, Bob Earl Hebner is a piece of shit. And I was like, really? You, <laughs> what the hell, man? I thought you were over it. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm over it now. But he still has so much shit to talk. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, 
it's weird to watch that special having just come off him being in the hall, like at right. the Hall yeah, of Fame, yeah. and, and this is all taped, you know, maybe a year ago. At this yeah, point, but know. even still, though, at that point, like him and Sean have, like, you know, have interacted and been friendly and all this other yeah. stuff. Who knows? You know, like it's, I don't know. Like I, I just think it's so weird when people say stuff. Don't people realize things get back to people? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like if you guys are good face to face, but you're going to do this other thing and still sound really bitter and say yeah. a lot of things about it. It's like that's not helping whatever ground you've covered in yeah. reestablishing a friendship or a relationship, repairing it. I think my favorite thing about this episode was how both uh, Jim Cornette and Vince Russo try to take credit for it. Yeah. When uh, in Sean's book, he talks about. According to Sean, what actually happened. Right. And have you read Sean's book? I haven't. Okay. I don't think I've read it because, like, I don't know why I didn't read it. Wasn't his son? I, I turned me off from, from it. I turned you off from reading it because he wrote it right after he was, you know, born again Christian and all that. And so, like, so much of the book is, you know, I told them in no uncertain terms. Like, well, what did you tell them? Or... He yeah, just glosses over did a lot it. of stuff. You did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the one. What, do, what does he say? Like, I know you're about so, to make a point, but what does he say happened with that handshake with Brett? That's not... He doesn't he cover, doesn't cover that. No, but what Has he... Has he ever he, refuted that? No. I don't think so. Um, he's never said it happened either, though. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what he says happened is that, you know, Brett doesn't want to do this. Every finish they take to Brett, he doesn't want to do because it involves him losing to Sean in Montreal. Losing the title. Mm -hmm. um, so Vince talks to Sean. And Sean and Hunter are together sharing a hotel room. So they're both on the phone. And they're talking about it. And Vince says, I have no idea what to do. And according to Sean Michaels, Triple H is the one that speaks up and says, I've if, heard if he doesn't want to do business, let's make him do business. So that's... The story I've always heard as the origin of it. Triple H has even talked... They did that Conf Confidential episode mm -hmm. where they talked about it. And, like, that's the story Sean and Triple H are telling on that sh episode. Granted, that's a company thing. Who fucking knows? But that's the story to me that's always stayed the same. Yeah. And I love Jim Cornette trying to take credit for it. And I'm, I'm not saying that maybe he didn't say, well, hey, if Brett doesn't want to do business, we'll do business for him. Because... Jim Cornette's someone has been around for a long fucking time, so he probably would say something like that, knowing shit like that has happened before. Shit like that has happened in WWF before. Mm -hmm. At WrestleMania with uh, Wendy Richter and yeah. Lula. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They, ten years prior, this shit had happened, so whatever. But, yeah, like, and the way that it's so, man, I can't fucking stand that guy because he talks about it like, I had this great idea, bro. <laughs> this was the only way to do it, bro. Like, come on, dude, get out of here. Mm -hmm. um, I love hate with Jim Carnett, though, too. Like, yeah, I, I want to like him. But then it's hard to that. Then he says stuff that just makes him sound so fucking full of himself yeah. that I'm just like, come on, man. Like, yeah, <laughs> he loses me. He loses me. Yeah. Um, but you know, to echo, uh, what friend of the show, Dan Herman has said about this thing, like this stuff is shot really well. It's yeah. edited really well. It's edited to tell you the story they want to tell you. So remember it's a documentary piece. So it's edited to tell the story that they think is the most intriguing and salacious and is going to get the most views. Yeah. And we, we've known this story. We've heard this story over and over and over again. We know how it's going to end, but I still found myself like, man, this is fuck. I was like, yeah. so... I was tired that day too, but suddenly I was wide awake and just like, yeah, all about it. But yeah, like I, I, I can't wait for you to watch the other two episodes yeah. and whatever ones air and before you get back, and we can really talk about the series as a whole when at that point There's six total, I think. Right? Yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoy watching it, but I always take documentaries like at face value. I don't and I don't take them as like gospel because yeah. you know there's fucking. Two sides or three sides to every story. Yours, mine, and the truth. And, right, exactly. And in this case, they talk to so many fucking people. There's like eighty sides to the story. Yeah, you know? pretty much. Like, and I always hate. I almost hate the majority of any wrestling thing that's put out there on a non wrestling forum. Right. Because that's what the public consumes, and then if it's not accurate, then they that's just it. that's just it, and so. I'm really particular about what gets presented about wrestling because yeah. it bothers me because that's the only thing those people will ever see and latch on to. 
Um, and they'll think because they saw something that is covering behind the scenes that they know something. Yeah. Because, I mean, not to knows. me, not to me, real, like, I mean, I left that special film, like, it really, I feel like they tried not to, but, I mean, it really makes it seem like Brett got the raw end of the deal. Which he did not. Yeah. You know, and, like, and they make it seem like WWE and Vince are fucking assholes, you know? Right. No, and, and Brett had, had, so when Brett wrote that book, he had, had just, uh, you know, quote unquote, repaired the bridge with WWF, WWE, because that's when the best there is, best there was, best there ever will be DVD set came out. Yeah. And he wanted to be a part of it because he figured, you know, I don't want them to do me like they did Warrior. So if they're going to put one out anyway, I guess I should be a part of it. Mm-hmm. So the book itself was written and came out afterward. Like, after he had supposedly come to terms with everything. But there's just still so much bitterness in that dude. And, like... You could tell the I, moment it gets brought up, it just probably reconjures yeah, it all and, again. and I can understand that. I totally get harboring resentment because of something that happened to him. But at the same time, to not be able to look in the mirror and say, Man, all of this could have been avoided. If I would have just went out on my back. Yeah. Like... Like, I, I can't... And every time people bring up like, oh man, you know, his dad was a promoter and he must be upset with this. I bet Stu was like, you did it to yourself, kid. You didn't go out on your back. Like for someone who had been around the business for his entire life should have known something was going to happen. And someone brought that up in the show too. Who what like, I think someone said, it's like, come on. I don't know if it was Jim Cornette. It might've been Jim Cornette. Yeah. Someone said like. You come from a wrestling family. Like, yeah. you know what you're supposed to... Or maybe it was Bruce Pritchard. I don't know. Somebody does say I think say it was Cornette. It. Yeah. Um, also, my favorite thing about this is this... My favorite thing about this whole situation, and it has always been my favorite thing about this situation since 1997, is fucking Scott Hall. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I want to talk about his that. His story has never fucking changed. Yeah. And I, I forgot that that's how he saw it. And... I'm watching it on the special, and I'm watching him retell it with visual aid, and yeah. I'm just like, man, he's got a fucking point. <laughs> like, it is interesting. He brings up, and like, I think every time I hear him say this, it plays in my head. I'm like, man, like, yeah, that is true. Like, why are they keeping the camera on him as he's spelling WCW? Why do they show a shot of Vince after he gets spit on? <laughs> right. Like, it's and, fucking weird. And like... Okay, so Brett talked about talks about in his book, and he even talked about Wrestling with Shadows, where he said, like, you know, Vince said he can't afford the contract. But he said that he would do whatever he had to do what was the to worth... help me get a better deal yeah. with WCW. What was the worth of the contract again? A million dollars a year. For 20, 20 years. years. Okay, because, like, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. But, like, the way... Just the way Brett said it in the yeah. thing, it made it sound... No, like it's it, like a million dollars for 20 years. yes that's yeah. what I'm like wait yeah, what? it was a million it's like yeah. 1.5 a year for that's, 20 yeah. years yeah, yeah, yeah. and he even says in the Wrestling With Shadows documentary and in his book that Vince told me he would do whatever he could to help me to broker that deal with WCW if it meant if it meant saying this is what we're offering you I'll say whatever I have to say and do whatever I have to do to make sure you get the best possible deal with WCW yeah Cut to Survivor Series. What is going to get him the most buzz leaving and going to WCW? Something like that. Mm. Why, and again, why is the camera on Brett so tight? Why is it so on Vince? Like, even leading up to that finish, when Brett has Sean in the sharpshooter, sharpshooter, instead of being a tight shot on Sean, like you would normally take... It's a wider shot where you see Earl Hebner looking at Vince and looking at Brett and looking back. Oh, no, what do I do? It's so and dramatic. Like, <laughs> I mean, even like the Wrestling With Shadows documentary just is conveniently being filmed at that particular time. And then it doesn't get the actual confrontation with him and him and uh, Vince, Brett, him yeah. and Vin, with Brett and Vince. Like, that's fucking convenient. Or, you know, Brett on this is like, oh, you know, like after it happened, I'm just standing over at Vince and... I wanted to go after him right there. And then I'm, I, I I think I said I'll watch him like, why didn't you? Yeah. What was stopping you? Yeah. It is weird that all he conjures up is a fucking spit. Mm-hmm. Sean is even still within his grasp. Like, he could have started pounding the shit out of fucking Sean. Yeah. And like, fuck, man. All this stuff, like, 
I threw a Mike Tyson-like uppercut and knocked Vince off his feet into the wall. Like, out, out cold, one out punch. Cold. You know, like all the stuff where whenever he talks about the Sean stuff, he's like, yeah, like I passed by Sean, I tapped him, and he was, he was crying like a baby. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. he, he always paints it like the other person is just so pathetic. Yeah, and then you see the footage of Sean sitting there next to him, and yeah, Sean's upset. Yeah. But he's not fucking crying like a baby. I like all that stuff. Or, or, or you know, like, yeah, like yeah. when they get into a, 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 a fight too. Like just all that stuff. Just yeah. the way they, the way Brett, Brett just always paints the prettiest picture of himself. And that everyone else is a pussy. I mean, how and funny, he beat how the funny fuck out of everybody. Yeah. Eric Bischoff has been calling him out on the reg for that shit on yeah. 83 weeks. Yeah. Like, all right, Conrad, but who does that benefit? Who does that? Who sounds like the world beating baby face that ended up coming back from the worst and darkest days? Like, mm-hmm. it's just the story Brett tells. And whatever, man. Like, dude's an amazing wrestler. Big fan of his work pre 97, November 97. Even the stuff in the SummerSlam match with Sean and Taker that year with, which, uh, Taker and Brett with Sean as the referee, all that stuff, man. Like, and if these guys, like, I understand, like, you know, you suck it up and do business. You know, Matt Hardy and Edge, they sucked it up and did business. Yeah. But, like, if there really was as much hatred and animosity as, you know, they claim there was, there's no fucking way. There's no fucking way that somebody like Bret Hart, who has painted himself the way he's painted himself, and someone like Shawn Michaels at the time, who we all know what Shawn Michaels' character and personality was like at the time, there's no way these two guys suck it up and do business. There's (laughs) no fucking way. Yeah. No way. I love I love Scott Hall talking to like I I almost yeah. want to rewatch that part. <laughs> Man, like I want I want him to have a gig with them so bad. Yeah. Like, I mean he comes to the performance. Yeah, and he does, like, yeah. but it's just he's so interesting to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that it's still that clip that cracks me up. I think Shut it's Shut up, Rick. <laughs> on the NXT uh breaking ground uh uh-huh. that piece yeah, that yeah, they yeah. on network. Yeah. Where he pulls Apollo Cruz aside and he goes Dude, all that stuff you said, all oh, that's great. You know what the problem is? I don't believe a fucking word of it. Yeah. Like, and that's the problem with guys, with characters and personalities like Apollo Cruz. You don't believe a fucking word or of what they're saying or doing. But yeah. That's true. I didn't realize, like, I like Brett. I like Brett a lot too. Yeah. I was always more of a Shawn Michaels course, guy. Yeah. But Same whenever here. I see clips of Bret Hart stuff, when he's cutting promos, man, like, he really wasn't that good on the microphone. And he has moments of He brilliance. has moments. <laughs> He's not bad. He's not terrible by any means. But, like, a lot of that was, I feel like, me just me being a little kid. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, I think it was the believability of him as a character. Yeah. Because he wasn't Shawn Michaels. He went out there, and he wrestled you, and he tied you in knots. And he was very straightforward. Almost like the prototype of he who should not be named. And how, yeah. how he became what he was. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really well done. Just take it for, with a grain of salt. And uh, enjoy the entertainment aspect of it. And all three episodes, again, are really well done. But again, take them as entertainment. Like you would take professional wrestling Mm -hmm. or a television show or a movie. It's all for the sake of entertainment. Absolutely. I do think it's funny, back on the Scott Hall thing for a second, I think it's Jim Cornette who says, and it's fucking true. It's like, I'm like, fuck off, Scott, as if you've never asked Sean about it. (laughs) We've never talked about it. You guys are fucking thick as thieves. Like, that whole group, like, give me a fucking break. There's no way that you've never (laughs) asked. Like, come on. You know. You just know. Yeah, he knows. Bullshit. Rick, come on back. We're done.